Hi, welcome to First Lutheran Church here in Colorado Springs. I'm Pastor Travis Norton, senior pastor here. We're so glad that you found us online, and we hope that this time blesses you. Today we're talking about conversations with Jesus and this controversy that Jesus stirred up when he healed a blind man on the Sabbath. But it's also a challenge to us and how we, how we are Jesus' church together and what he calls us to be. I hope it blesses you. Let's prepare our hearts for prayer. Father, thank you for the healing that you do and the ways that you challenge us to, to see more clearly, to see you and to see the people you love better than we do right now. Remove us of our blindness and forgive us of our sins that we might turn and follow you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. may be seated. It's a long Lenten passage. As Jesus walked along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying it is he, others were saying no, but it's someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man, but they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus, made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind, now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, 
We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he's of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. You want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, you are his disciples, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, well, here's an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins and you're trying to teach us. And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? He answered, and who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, you have seen him and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. How many of you like a good controversy? <laughs> I was uh, watching uh, Netflix the other day, and there's this new documentary called Full Swing. Some of you may have seen it. It follows golfers on the PGA Tour. And they filmed them uh, a couple of years ago when there was a big controversy in the institution of golf. It was a lot of the, the players were leaving the PGA Tour to go to the Live Tour, which is a Saudi-backed tour. Apparently, they can make more money and play less there. But everybody was up in arms around it, about it and irate. At least these millionaire golfers were. And that's the kind of controversy I like. You know, I just sat back and ate my popcorn as all these rich people argued about where to play their game. <laughs> controversy like that entertains me. But as I was watching, there was something a little familiar about the controversy that I didn't like. It reminded me that controversies happen in all institutions, and they also happen in institutions like the church. I was having lunch this week with uh, the pastors who serve the, the large downtown churches, and the Methodist pastor shared with us that there is a controversy raging through the United Methodist Church right now over sexuality. And she told us that about half the Methodist churches in Colorado Springs have voted to disaffiliate from their denomination. And as she shared, it brought back memories of our own controversy in the ELCA when we lost about 10% of our membership over the same thing and started a decline that continues to this day. And those are just modern controversies. All right, my home, le my home church in Sandy, Utah, left our denomination when the uh, Lutherans decided to get together with the Episcopalians, and that was too much for them, and, and so they left. And I remember all the people that were hurt in that fight and that decision. When I went to seminary, I had to take a class called The History of Lutheranism in North America, and it was kind of a sad class because it was a history of division, a history of schisms, of the church breaking apart and trying to come together and then breaking apart again, over everything under the sun. We have fought over the interpretation of Scripture. We have fought over which language should be spoken in worship and used. 
We have fought and divided over a thousand other things, large and small. Not to mention that our whole existence as a Lutheran church, we exist because of a church fight, because of controversy over the role of works in our salvation. I suppose controversy in the church is unavoidable, but people always get hurt. And we can never forget it's the individuals who get hurt when the church decides to fight. I imagine some of you have your own stories of churches you grew up in or have been a part of, and you've seen church fights, and you've seen the damage it can do to people's personal faith. The story that we read today about Jesus healing a blind man, it's a story of controversy and the people who got hurt. It's a story of the limits of religion. It's a story that calls organized religion to account for how we treat those on the margins. There was no controversy until Jesus showed up. There was a blind man whom everyone knew who tried to make a living begging on the street. That was not controversial. That was status quo. Everyone was okay with that. They were okay with it because they thought they understood it. They thought they understood why this man was blind. He was being punished for something. He must be a sinner, or maybe his parents were sinners. But they had concocted a theology that made it okay for the man in this community to be reduced to begging. There was no controversy until Jesus showed up. It was a Sabbath day when Jesus stirred the pot. The day when no one was supposed to work, Jesus took compassion on the blind man and healed him with mud made from dirt and spit. And then he told the man to go do some work himself on the Sabbath, to go to the pool of Siloam and wash and receive his sight. The whole action seems less about the man being healed and more about Jesus pointing out a major flaw in his religion. Let me ask you this. How would you react if some member of our congregation who had a chronic illness or a disability were miraculously healed? You'd praise God, wouldn't you? You'd give thanks and give glory to God for the miracle. What if the member was healed by a Buddhist or a Muslim or an atheist? Some of you might be a little more skeptical. Well, maybe that's okay. Would we still rejoice? You know, in this story, nobody seems to be rejoicing that this blind man who washed in the pool of Siloam is healed can see for the first time in his life, especially when he tells people who did it, when he says it was Jesus. They, the Pharisees, had already decided that Jesus was a threat and they would kick anyone out of the synagogue who believed in him. So they can't rejoice with this man who just experienced a miracle. They're closed off to it. Instead, they hold an investigation. In the church words, they would say they formed a committee. They wonder if maybe he isn't the same man that everyone knew to be a blind beggar. But that story doesn't hold water. Too many witnesses confirm that it is indeed the same man. His parents instead also insist that it's the same man. When they go to investigate the parents, they're so scared, they don't want to say anything. They don't want any part of this controversy. They love their church. They don't want to get kicked out. They need this community. They can't imagine themselves ostracized from the center of their life, the center of their village. They are not brave parents. They do not stand up for their son. They wash their hands and they say, he's of age, go ask him. And the Pharisees do. They interrogate the healed man. And this healed man has some gumption. He is not afraid of these religious authorities And you can understand why. Imagine spending your life outside of the synagogue begging for money. It might harden your heart against those inside running the religion. Plus, he has just experienced the power of God in an undeniable way. He couldn't deny it even if he wanted to. And I love how this man challenges the authority, challenges the Pharisees, pointing out that maybe they're the blind ones. Maybe they're the ones who can't see what is from God. But rather than repent and give praise to God for the miracle done in their community, the Pharisees drive him out. They kick him out of the synagogue. 
although I wonder if he was ever included in the first, time, in the first place, did he actually lose anything? What happened next gives me great love for Jesus. Jesus heard what had happened, that the man he had healed had been kicked out of the synagogue. And what does Jesus do? He goes and finds him. He seeks him out. Some of you need to hear this today because you still bear the scars of a church fight. You've been hurt by religion or those in authority. Maybe not kicked out, but judged or condemned or ignored or despised. Jesus comes and finds the blind man, the healed man, who had just lost his community, whose parents won't even defend him. Jesus comes and finds the man to give him more than just his sight, but to open his eyes to see the Son of God, the Messiah, to see salvation. And the man believes, which in John's gospel is what sight means. It means to believe in Jesus, to have your eyes open to the kingdom of God. Jesus comes and he finds us when we are kicked out, when we are ostracized, when we are sidelined, when we are alone, when the system grinds us up. Jesus comes and he finds us. And he shows us what he wants his church to be like. The Pharisees thought they had to protect religion thought that their job was to keep it pure, make sure the commandments were obeyed, make sure people follow the rules. But in doing that, they corrupted the religion. They made it about a relationship with rules instead of a relationship with the living God. That doesn't mean the rules are thrown out. There are still standards. But the relationship is with Jesus. He is the one who interprets the rules. He is the one who guides us to obey the commandments. Remember, that's what we studied during the season after Epiphany. Jesus taught, you have heard it said, but I say to you. Our relationship is with Jesus. He guides us on the best way to live. You know, think of what the author of the book of James said about what true religion is. He said, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained in the world. Jesus' church should be known for its love for those in need, for the way we love orphans and widows, the needy and the poor. And Jesus' church should be known for how we keep ourselves unstained by the world in our ethics, in our morality. We should live differently. But the only way to do that well, to keep it in right balance, is in prayerful relationship with Jesus. We cannot just become a secular institution that does good in the world without any connection to God and spiritual transformation. We are not just a social service agency. We are not only concerned with doing justice. Remember, Jesus healed the blind man, but then also invited him to see and believe in the Messiah. And we can't just become a moral institution that enforces rules and ethics without compassion, without pursuing justice. Otherwise, we become just like the Pharisees, who care more about Sabbath obedience than we do about the blind man on the corner begging for his life. Religion is not just about doing good for those in need. It is not just about doing justice. Religion is not just about being good or being morally pure. Religion is about Jesus, knowing him to be the Son of God, believing in him for salvation, and inviting him in to judge our lives, to transform us, to make us different people, to send us out into the world changed. Everything we do comes from our relationship with the one who died on the cross and rose from the dead. The one who met with the Pharisee Nicodemus at night, who talked theology with him into the wee hours of the morning and invited him to see a God who loves the world. The one who sat with a Samaritan woman at the well and offered her living water regardless of her history the one who sparked controversy by healing a blind man on the Sabbath day and opened our eyes 
to a religion of compassion and love. The only controversy I'm interested in is the controversy caused by Jesus. And we have to acknowledge that that's what he does. He says in the gospel, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see and those who do see may become blind. As his followers, we welcome this judgment into our lives, especially during Lent. We ask Jesus, reveal our blind spots. Open our eyes to see the world the way you see the world so we may serve the people that we have been blind to. Sometimes we read these stories in Scripture and we immediately identify with the blind man who was healed. And that's okay. Because we also need healing. We also cry out to Jesus to open our eyes, to help us to see the world better, to be included when we've been locked out. But we also need to do the work of identifying with the other characters in the story, with the parents who are too afraid to get involved, would just like things to stay the same. Keep me out of it. You ever felt like that? I have. To repent of our fear, to repent of our desire for safety and control, and also to identify with the Pharisees. Maybe that's the hardest work of all, who thought it was their job to protect religion, rather than being open to God doing new things. The controversy Jesus brings is a controversy in our own lives because he's always asking us to be changed by him, to repent of our sin and be healed so that we might see the fullness of his love. How is Jesus changing you today? Are you open to that judgment are you open to being changed? May God soften our hearts and open our eyes that we might believe and repent and believe and be saved. Amen. We do pray that God spoke to you today through the message. If you want to take next steps, we've created an online course called Basic Training that goes through the basics of the Christian faith uh, step by step. So I encourage you to take that. That's also on this YouTube channel. I encourage you to support this ministry online through your tithes and offerings. You can do that by going to our website, www.flccs.net. And then also in the description of this video, you'll see a link to a connection card. That's a great way to contact us. Let us know if you are moved to come to faith during this time. If you're ready to talk to a pastor about next steps, we'd love to talk to you there. Just let us know that you were here and any comments, we appreciate that. May God bless you as you continue to walk with the Lord.